Bottom line, this did DJ TJ, that's Donald Trump Jr., break the law by taking the meeting? Listen, Stephanie, you did a terrific job laying out the law. I start my teaching my t students in a couple weeks, and I couldn't even do it as well as you did. I mean, we have not only a, a code of federal regulations, but a United States statute passed by the United States Congress three different times that basically says we don't want foreign nationals mucking around in our elections. It's very broad. It does not require that the that they actually achieve some kind of benefit from a foreigner. Soliciting, meaning trying to get something of benefit from a foreign foreign national is verboten. It's, it's, it's against the law. So that's one thing. The second thing, you mentioned conspiracy. Um, Robert Mueller has already indicted multiple members of the, uh, the Russian intelligence community for hacking into uh, um, servers and stealing voter information to the extent to which that conspiracy could be uh, added to by virtue of what happened here. We have potential conspiracy crime. We have a potential obstruction of justice because we have stuff that was covered up. Um, and then, of course, we have a potential perjury charge by um, Don Jr. To, in connection with his testimony in Congress. So there's a, a broad range of wrongdoing here. The real question is, what are we going to do about it? I mean, J Jay Sekulow said, is there a crime? Well, we're answering the question, I think, yes. And then what's going to happen about it? I mean, is the American public going to tolerate this? We're putting children in jail because their parents committed misdemeanors at the borders, and then we've got this level of wrongdoing at the highest echelons of, of the office, which go to the heart of our democracy, and people are shrugging, and I think it's really, really dangerous to continue on this path. Brett, why would the president be doing this? If it's about popularity and his base or the media, the Russia investigation isn't winning Trump any votes, and it's not losing Trump any votes. People feel the way they feel about it. But at the very least, what he did this weekend over Twitter could put him in greater legal jeopardy. So why do that? Because it was stupid. Uh, look, Technically I mean, speaking, because it was stupid. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> look, you can't always seek uh, explanations for the president's behavior in some form of uh, higher rationality. Uh, I mean, there is clearly a neurotic tick going on here. He is he is fulminating. This is this is obsessing his mind, and this is the risk for any administration of a president whose every stray thought goes onto Twitter, because some of those stray thoughts, I think, clearly amount to attempts to obstruct justice. So he is digging his he is digging a legal hole uh, for himself that's going to be very deep. The issue, however, is this: I agree with every word that Kim said, and and you really did lay out the legal facts beautifully. But here's, here's, here's the other detail. Bob Mueller, according to Justice Department regulations, cannot indict the president. So the issue ends up being a political issue. Would Bob Mueller's uh, a report from the special counsel lead Republicans in Congress to conclude that they have no recourse other than the constitutional one to impeach and convict the president for high crimes and misdemeanors? So if there is a higher rationality at play here, and that's always questionable with, uh, with Trump, it's that he is, he is speaking politically to other Republicans and the Republican base, not playing a legal game with, uh, with uh, the special counsel. Okay, so those are the Republicans who understand the legal game. Right. What is more important to them, Robert Mueller's report or how the public reads the president's misinformation? Well, it depends on where you are as a Republican, right? If you're in a safe seat, all you care about is making sure the president is safe. If you're on the line, if you may be facing a blue wave, if you're somebody who might be connected this one way or another, you're concerned about what the president is saying. And, and that's where I think the real problem is. The president is it's not just sort of the neurotic ticks that Brett is talking about, but he is consistently sort of conflating political and legal problems, which puts everybody who's trying to defend him in trouble. Even when we go back, and remember the key thing about the whole adoptions is adoptions are connected to the Majeski Act, which ding, are connected ding, ding, to ding, sanctions, yeah. which means it was whole, never really about even when exactly. they said it was about adoptions. Yeah. Ado adoptions are code. Exactly, exactly. That's like saying, oh, I'm going shopping for a car and I'm a getaway driver. Like, everybody <laughs> knew that there was something else going on. So, you know, to the degree that that also leads to uh, it looking like there was collusion, it looking like they were getting material help, that's where the president gets everybody in trouble. Okay, well, speaking of everybody being in trouble, let's stick with Don Jr. Because, Kim, you have written in the past that Mueller could use Don Jr. as a way to get to the president. But Don Jr., ain't your normal uh, consigliere to the president. It's his son. Do you really think that could happen? Well, uh, you know, he's not protected by the pardon power. Um, he's not protected by the impeachment clause, which I agree with Brett. There's, there are DOJ um, guidance that suggests that that 
couldn't couldn't indict a president. Uh, I think there's some ambiguity but there. But Don possibility. Jr.'s power base, his universe, his popularity, the reason everyone's inviting him to go hunting all around the world and speak and getting fees to speak to speak greater than he ever imagined is because his father's the president. Yeah, but I don't think I don't think Bob Mueller cares about that, and so he's not protected in that way. And the other piece to keep in mind is we've got these emoluments clause uh, litigation going Ooh. forward. So we have two pieces: we've got his children, and we have his business empire. So if you can't get directly to the president, you can get to the things he holds very, very dearly to to his, to his heart here, and and perhaps then there's come some pressure on him um, to do something that's best for the American public. Which can, in my personal professional view at this point, would be to step down because he's not fit for office at this point. Okay, well, I want to talk about something that's near to my heart, what Brett wrote about this weekend. Now, the president tweeted about the media, we know this, calling it the enemy of the people, dangerous and sick. You wrote a column this weekend titled, quote, Trump will have blood on his hands while he is responsible for something someone else might do. Walk us through this. So, uh, I mean, that's a heavy, that, uh, that, that's a, those are heavy words. At the end of May, I wrote a column saying that ABC was right to cancel Roseanne because of a racist, tweets, uh, or racist tweet. Uh, I received a voicemail uh, the next day. Um, a man who sounded to me like um, white, male, late middle-aged, uh, slightly southern accent, uh, fantasizing about me uh, and other journalists being killed, uh, being murdered by people with uh, AR-15s. Then that ended in a racist rant with the N-word used, I think, about um, uh, a dozen times. And then have a nice day and love her. And then, and then he, he clicked off. That is the third time since Trump, uh, the Trump phenomenon began that I have been violently threatened by a Trump, uh, by someone who's clearly a Trump supporter. The only we should also remind our audience that you're conservative. Yeah, well, uh, but not 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 a fan of the president, and that's I think that's that that's what uh, is key here. The only time I've been similarly threatened is by someone who later went to jail for uh, supporting Hezbollah. So I, I, we take this uh, very seriously. Now I put that voicemail to one side for four weeks, and then the killing uh, at Annapolis at the Capitol Gazette, five journalists mm -hmm. uh, murdered uh, murdered there, and then you had the president going on about fake news. Now. I think when the president goes to his rallies and starts screaming about the fa fake news, the most he wants is for people to give CNN's Jim Acosta uh, a middle finger. That's, that's the emotion. But if a thousand people are giving Jim Acosta a middle finger, some subset of that, say 10 people, are people like my caller. And then some subset of that are going to be people who are willing to take it to the next step. There is someone out there. We live in the age of the active shooter, and the president is goading them. He is inciting them. He is not saying, get me, get rid of this turbulent priest, but he's not a child who doesn't know that he's, he's carrying a loaded gun. The blood will be on his hands the moment some whack job thinks that he is carrying out the instructions of the president and goes into a newsroom like the one behind us or the one in my news, news organization or yours and murders people. I pray that you are wrong. I do too. But let's pretend that Brett isn't. Fast forward. Let's say something absolutely awful happens like that. Brett says the president will have blood on his hands. Will he, or will the answer again be, blame on many sides? Um, he'll take absolutely no responsibility for it. And, and, and that's the problem. And, I, and I, I, not only do I empathize with Brett, but this is even more personal for me. I work at a college. I work at a college of primarily African-American students. So the kind of hostility that this president has raised, both against people of color and against journalists, is a direct threat. I got anthrax sent to me, fake anthrax sent to me once at my office, right? I, I've, I've had threats uh, against me dozens of times, both in person, and I'm going to Charlottesville this weekend for the one-year anniversary of the march because I'm also a UVA alumni. So this is a, a serious issue, and the president doesn't care. And what's more problematic about that is the Republican Party doesn't okay, care. Okay, this is what I want to ask about the Republican Party doesn't care. Jamie Dimon, for example, is a CEO who I think does a superb job. I know him quite well. And what always blows my mind is when I hear Jamie Dimon say things like, ignore what he tweets, stop listening to what he tweets, look at the policies, the policies are good. Yeah, well, this when is, is it, when are we going to see leaders who know better, who know that they could not ever say or do things like that, it would cost them their jobs, they would fire anyone in their organizations if they said things like this. When are we going to start to see corporate and government leaders say, hold on a second? 
Well, there are, you know, there, there, there are a few. There have been a few. My, uh, Seth Klarman at, at, at Baupost and, yeah, and so on have been, uh, have been outspoken. But look, there's this sort of higher wisdom that says, oh, you should take, the, pre you should it, take it, the president seriously, but not literally. But uh, maybe. But lots of people out there take him absolutely literally. And if you are the enemy of the American people, right. then the logical consequence is we have to deal severely and, and with it, but our enemies. Let me just say one thing. Yeah. Seth Klarman did do an extraordinary thing, but Baupost is a private hedge fund. Tell me a CEO of a company who has customers or employees that span the political spectrum, that have the courage, the decency to say this is wrong and this is a threat to people. Because I don't know what that, I don't know what no, CEO is doing they, that. They, they, that, that. That's exactly it. They are not speaking up and it will be too late should there be a, a national tragedy for them, for them to speak up or for those nice Republicans in Congress who have been sort of mutedly saying, well, we don't quite like what the president is saying. This is why you take, you, you, you take a, a moral stand before the tragic event occurs. And, and this is the other thing. We're going to have a Charlie Hebdo situation here. Without question, without question, it is going to happen because of the behavior of this president. And what disgusts me about Please this, don't let that be. It, 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 what particularly disgusts me about it is, these are local reporters we're talking about who, who have great relationships. The vast majority community of media reporters, yeah, these are the local community reporters and the Republicans, the Republican members of Congress, the Democrats usually complain about the Republican members of Congress who turn a blind eye to that same local reporter that they knew in high school when she interned with them and is now working for the state paper, and that person may be under threat, and they don't care. about about it. That is why this is a danger, not just to national security, but our very sovereignty and our constitution. You know, a conservative friend of mine wrote me after that comment. He said, well, you know what? Free speech goes both ways, and the press gives Trump such, uh, such a hard time. I wrote him back. I said, look, the press has been giving presidents a hard time since the second Washington administration, right. all right? This is the first time that the president has answered. And by the way, when the president goes out, he's surrounded by a Praetorian guard known as the Secret Service. When we go out in the streets with our children, with our families, we have, we have nobody. This is, inside, this is a demagoguery that this country has never witnessed in its history. You have Gian Ford, who's in Congress right now, who attacked a member of the press, and Paul Ryan, and no one else said anything about it. They could have kept him from being seated. Body slammed him the day before the election, and he won. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Kim, thank you. And I, gotta, and I gotta thank my producer, Dave Murphy. He is the one who helped us lay out exactly what's at stake. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.